So let's start by talking about sequential programming. You might think, why are we talking about sequential programming, Dr. Schmidt, since this is a course on parallel programming? Well, it always helps to know what the baseline is to see what we're going to do to improve upon what's been in the past, number one. And number two, most of you probably are a lot more comfortable with sequential programming because most of what you've done, most likely, unless you've done internships or taken some courses like the operating system course, are going to be fairly sequential. So we're going to start out by talking about what is sequential programming and what are some of its key concepts. And basically at a high level, which will be filled in in more detail shortly, it means each step in a program is executed in order one at a time. That's kind of the meaning of sequential. And it's very important to master these concepts before trying to learn more advanced concurrent and parallel programming concepts. If you can't write sequential programs correctly, whoo boy, is it going to be hard to write parallel programs and concurrent programs correctly. So it's important to understand what's going on there. Again, I think you probably have a pretty good intuitive feel for this already. So sequential programming is a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. So another way of saying this is the execution sequence is deterministic. It, you always get the same results for the same input. Given a certain input, the same output will always be produced in the same order. Um, I always love visual metaphors. You will, you will see endless visual metaphors in this class because that's the way I think. And so a good example of sequential processing is a drive through at a fast food restaurant where people go one at a time. And what's good and bad about that? Well, the good part is you just sit in line and you're served when it's your turn. The bad part is if you have an order that could be done very quickly, like let's say you want to get a, a diet soda, and the person in front of you is a minivan full of soccer kids who want special ordered stuff, then you're just going to have to sit there and wait. So we'll talk about why concurrency will give you a win, because you can run things in different orders than they were initially submitted, and things that take less time may get done faster. Of course, deterministic behavior in sequential programs assumes there is no deliberate use of randomness. Some programs use randomness. They use randomness for various reasons. So I'm not talking about that. Of course, you can have a sequential program that uses randomness. Then it will not be deterministic. But that's not what we're talking about here. We will also talk later about how Java and its fork join framework, which is very important here early in the course, will use randomness intentionally to make programs work more optimally. And we'll talk about how that works. It's all about maximizing utilization and trying to make sure that threads that don't have much to work on can get a chance to grab work from threads that have too much stuff to work on. Something that's called work stealing. And you'll see more about work stealing as we go along in this. There are two main characteristics of sequential programs. The first is the textural order of statements specifies their order of execution. So here's a very simple example. This is an implementation of the get method in Java ArrayList. You can go look at the source code if you're curious to see more of this. And it's going to first range check the index to make sure it's in bounds. And then it's going to return the item at the indexed location into element data. Chaos and insanity will incur, will occur if for some reason this sequence gets swapped. That would be the end of the world, right? Because you'd grab data that might be out of range of the index. So that's one of the characteristics of sequential programs. The other characteristic of sequential programs is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap that's visible to programs. So what the heck does that mean? So let's talk about that. So let's take a look at a simple example here. We have a code sequence where we say variable A is assigned B plus C, and D is assigned the results of E minus A. And of course, what you want to have happen here is you want the value of A to have been assigned before the value of D is assigned. If that doesn't occur, again, chaos and insanity will ensue. So even though I just told you that in a sequential program, it has to behave as if there was no temporal overlap, lower layers in the stack may reorder instructions in a way that's invisible to programs. So what do I mean by lower layers in the stack? Well, as you probably know, you have the application layer, which is mostly where you will write your code, certainly where you write your code in this class. But there's all kinds of other layers. There's framework layers. There's threading and synchronization layers. There's the execution environment for the Java, like the Java virtual machine, or the Android runtime environment. There are system libraries, like libc. There are operating system kernel 
modules for scheduling and networking and memory access. And then finally, way down here at the very bottom of this stack is the hardware, which is chock full of ways of rearranging instruction sequences to run in different orders to optimize the performance of stuff. What would be an example of that, you might ask? Well, out of order execution is commonly used to avoid pipeline stalls that would delay instruction execution in modern pipelined processors. And you can learn about out of order execution, you can learn about pipeline stalls here for various ways. So we're going to take a look at what's going on here. And to do this, we're going to assume that A, B, C, D, and E are in memory. They're not in, I should say, in, in main memory. And loads and stores take one clock cycle out of order. And then we're going to see how instruction scheduling can eliminate pipeline stalls. So let's take a look at this. So here is the original assembly code, which is sort of a mock assembly code, that has stalls in it. So you can see what we're going to do is we're going to load the value of B into register RB. We're going to load the value of C into uh, register RC. And then there's a pipeline stall here. And then we're going to go ahead and add the uh, contents of RA and RB into C. And then there's also some other stalls that occur down below as well. And so these things end up waiting. When a stall occurs, processors are not being maximally utilized. So here's a way to rearrange that assembly code without changing the meaning, but rearranging it to have no stalls. And what you do is you essentially preload the value of E from into a register ahead of when you actually need it, but in a way that doesn't actually change the behavior of the code or the meaning of the code. So this is a nice example of how rearranging stuff will get rid of stalls and make your code run faster. The processor is perfectly free to do that. Moreover, there's other things that rearrange stuff, and we'll talk about that later when we talk about the Java fork join pool where you can do work stealing. So the order in which you put things into the pool may in fact not be the order in which things run. And that is a, an intentionally good idea to improve stuff. So uh, mercifully, these optimizations typically occur under the hood. However, there can be some serious problems when people aren't aware of this, especially in concurrent and parallel programs. We'll talk more about that later. So that was a quick overview of sequential programming concepts. You don't honestly have to really know all the the gory details about instruction reordering and pipeline stalls. That was just there to point out that the behavior of the program needs to be such that it appears as if the operations run in sequence without rearranging. But the implementations can rearrange stuff as long as it doesn't affect the meaning or the semantics of the computation.